Good afternoon, and welcome to our special panel today. It's titled, What Happens There Affects Us Here, and it's sponsored by the Department of Anthropology, uh, but I'd also like to extend some special thanks to Hofstra Cultural Center, uh, especially Athleen Collins and Carol Mallison, uh, for all of their support and assistance. Clearly, the idea of um, thinking about what's happening there, right, that there and here evokes a sense of global interconnectedness, right? We often talk about that in our anthropology, or global studies courses, and political science. Um, but in particular, we're concerned with the there today as Palestine and Israel and the way what's going on there now all of the um, collective punishment, the starvation, you know, we've seen all of these images of all of this um, really brutal uh, violence and it's ongoing. And so we want to think in various ways about how it relates back to us here, right? And so we can follow various sort of threads. So we can think, you know, socially and, and uh, culturally, uh, we can follow the connections and articulations historically, uh, politically, and of course we can follow and should follow the money, right? And so we can do it in a variety of ways, uh, but you're not here for a scholarly lecture on that today uh, from one uh, faculty member, but we really have a special um, uh, panel today, and we really have the privilege of having a group of knowledgeable students leading our exploration on these interconnections and these articulations that we have in our society in various ways with what's going on right now in Palestine and, and Israel. Um, and so um, I'd like to introduce um, our panel. I think it's, you know, we have a wonderfully diverse panel. I'd like to um, introduce them to you, and then we're going to focus on um, their presentations and uh, on their voices. Um, and so we have here to my left, Zainab Mazawala. She identifies as a Muslim American, and she's a pre-law triple major. Um, and next to her, we have Giovanni Selsa, who identifies as Palestinian Christian, and he's a history major. Uh, and then we have Michael Katzen, uh, who identifies as Jewish American, and he's a filmmaking major. Um, and we also have Ritika Singh, uh, who identifies as Punjabi Sikh, um, and she's a religion and contemporary issues major. Uh, and then Alicia Paracha, who identifies as Pakistani American, and is a political science major. And then uh, last but not least is Elma Glavatovich, who identifies as Albanian American, and she's a psychology major. And I should add that they're now all honorary anthropology majors. And so we're going to, and a little bit about the format, they're going to each uh, give us their presentations, their statements. We're going to hear their voices. Um, and then I will ask a round of questions to the panel. You know, some may choose the answers, some may, some may not. But we'll get answers to a variety of questions um, to further some of our explorations. Uh, and then we'll open it up for a Q&A from the audience. So to get us started, we're going to begin with our first presenter. It's going to be Zainab Mazawala. Thank you for that introduction, Professor Daniels. Um, yeah, so my name is Zainab Mazawala. I'm a triple major in economics, global studies, and political science. And I'm also a third year in LEAP, which is the law program that we have here at Hofstra. As a Muslim, of course, it pains me to see my people hurt and have the same false rhetoric always being spread not being looked at as human, and murder being justified because of the word terrorist. I'm a third generation American college student. My parents are born here, my mom actually went to Hofstra, my grandparents went to college here, but I feel help helpless in my own country. 
A little bit ago, after October, 7th, after October 7th, I was called a terrorist in Long Island, where I was born and raised. That same word has continuously come back to haunt me. White supremacists used black people as being born inferior as a justification for slavery. And Israel is justifying the murder of Palestinians by calling them born terrorists. As a human, I genuinely do not understand how hardened a heart has to be to where they can wake up and see videos of babies being bombed and their heart still doesn't shatter? Of course, being a Muslim plays a huge part in my life. It, it is my identity. But I'm not here because I'm Muslim. I'm here because I'm human. And as a human, I am hurting, knowing that 30,000 plus people have died, knowing that over a million people have been displaced from their homes, and there are literal two-year-olds stuck under the rubble as we're speaking right now. I'm here because my heart hurts knowing that there's a humanitarian crisis in Gaza. You have a population of two million people starving. And these people aren't starving because of a natural crisis. They're being starved. And they live under an occupation. They're restricted to fuel, water, food, electricity. If that's not occupation, I don't know what is. And we are the ones funding this occupation. And as an American, my money is given to kill my brothers and sisters across the world and seeing that the only way that these people can get food is by humiliating themselves and fighting for scraps falling from the sky. Thank you, America. Yes, I am Muslim, but we are all human here. And as humans, we must take initiative. I started a club here at Hofstra under Students for Justice in Palestine. But that word, like I mentioned, coming to get me back as always, terrorists. We were labeled as a terrorist organization, and because of negative national connotations, we had to change our name. But regardless of what we changed it to, we changed it to SVP, and we're still labeled as, terrorist, as a terrorist group by other students on campus. As a Muslim, my mind flashes back to when I was 12 years old. I was in eighth grade, and I just started wearing hijab, and I was walking through my middle school halls, and I feel something on my back, so, I grab the paper, kid walks by me, I look at it, and it says terrorist. This is eighth grade me, 12 years old, new hijabi. A terrorist sign was put on my back. But honestly, I'm lucky. I got a, ter I got a sign put on my back because of this false given label identity of a terrorist. But little Zainabs in Palestine, they get bombs dropped on their house because these children are identified as terrorists. These are innocent kids. And the war on Gaza affects me because as a student, I feel suppressed and forced into a box of this label. And it affects me as a Muslim who must be forced to condemn actions that do not represent me before I'm allowed to mourn over the loss of innocent children and babies. And it affects me as an American who is actively funding the murder and occupation of indigenous people. And most importantly, it affects me as a human with a heart. A heart that is not and will never be okay with seeing flesh on the ground as fathers prostrate over their dead son's body asking that God takes care of them in heaven. Thank you. And our next student panelist is Giovanni Selsen. Thank you. Um, so this situation is personal to me because I am Palestinian through and through. My entire family is Palestinian. They were born and raised there generation after generation, dating prior to Israel's existence. I am Palestinian. And the only reason I stand here as, or sit here as an American citizen is because my parents are fortunate enough to get out of Palestine so that I can be born as an American citizen so I have the opportunities they do not have. If they were not fortunate enough to get out at the time they did, I would, I would still be in the West Bank right now. Um, I have been studying this situation in Palestine since I was very, very little. Like, this is not something a kid should be exposed to at such a young age, but this has been my reality to, to see what my people has been going through. And, um, and seeing these horrific images isn't new. Uh, Palestinians on the ground have been recording this, taking pictures of it, 
taking videos to show the Western world for many, many years. And it's finally gaining traction now, almost a little too late. Um, so I carry with me th this very deep-rooted genera generational trauma on the genocide against the Palestinians. And I have spent every minute of my life since I've be been conscious of it to educate others and to raise awareness, use my voice for them, on behalf of them. I carry a lot of guilt with me of having the opportunities that I have here when I'm not back home helping my people. And, and it's just, it makes matters worse when we're deliberately silenced just by speaking out on behalf of Palestinians that are murdered. Um, I, it, I wasn't always in tune with my identity. There was a brief period of time where no one knew who, Pal who Palestinians were, and if they did, they frowned upon me, called me a terrorist, similar to Zainab's experiences. Um, so there was a long period of time where I wanted to be white. I grew up in in suburban Pennsylvania. Most of my peers were white. It was, it was like the rate, the statistic was like 95% white in my town, and I just wanted to be white. I just could not live with being othered. And it wasn't until I visited Palestine in 2019 where things really clicked. Um, I got to see the walls they built to keep us animals contained. Um, I stood behind an IDF soldier with a rifle strapped to his back whenever we were crossing some borders to go visit religious sites. I have a picture of that. Um, I, took, I was standing directly behind an IDF soldier, and I have a picture of a rifle directly in front of my face. And it's, this is the reality that we have to live through. Everywhere we go in Palestine, there are checkpoints. So I got to see this for myself. And after that, everything kind of clicked. I, I, I became proud to be a Palestinian, and I, I came into my own. And ever since then, I have just been trying to use my voice to educate about the Palestinian struggle. Um, it's back to, you know, raising awareness. These videos that Palestinians post, they're not posting this because they, they like to record this stuff. They are trying to get our attention in the West to try to make change, to encourage people to take action. And a lot of people are dismissive of it, and they just willingly ignore it. Or if they see a kid getting shot and bloodied and murdered, they'll say they will grow up to be Hamas. And they use that as justification for, for the bombings of, of children. And um, I, I, I force myself to watch every horrific video that comes out because if this is the reality that they have to live and see and be forced to witness, then the least I could do is, is see that stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm a Jewish American. Uh, I was raised to be proud of my heritage. Uh, my mom would drive me and my sister 30 minutes to our temple. Uh, when our temple closed down because there wasn't enough members, she'd drive us to a completely different state just so we can keep getting our Torah portions and keep learning. Um, what Israel is doing is a travesty. And what makes me more upset is that they're doing it in my name. When Israel raids Palestinian villages, when Israel bombs children, uh, it is done theoretically in my name. Uh, I speak out uh, because I do not want my name to be used uh, in their ongoing campaign. And in particular, um, as the minority in the Jewish community, I'm not. Um, I'm an anti-Zionist. I don't believe uh, in the idea of nationalism uh, as means of liberation. I don't believe in the means of aiming a gun at another as means of realizing the humanity of oneself. Um, but because of that, because I'm vocal against the violence, because I'm vocal against the hatred against Palestinians and Muslim Americans living uh, over here, uh, I'm accused of being a tokenized uh, Jew. I'm accused of using my Jewish heritage as a way of devaluing what's going on. I'm accused of wanting another Holocaust. I'm accused of 
Sorry. Um, as um, don't hold it. Sorry. Um, so I learned uh, a lot about Jewish history uh, during my confirmation class and on my own. Uh, my family descends from Kishinev, which was an area of Moldova, uh, which had one of the largest pogroms in Jewish history. Uh, my family fled there and then went to the epicenter of Jewish culture in Brooklyn. Um, the, um, the conditions of the Pale of Settlement, which Russian Jews were relegated to for hundreds of years, mimic starkly the conditions of which Palestinians are treated in Gaza and the West Bank. Um, as Gio said, there are checkpoints which limit where they can move. Um, you know, I have $500 given to me by my temple. I'm fully able to freely visit Israel whenever I want, no cost of my own. But uh, Palestinian Americans who just want to visit their family have to go through arduous visa processes um, just to be able to see their grandmother. Uh, Rashida Tlaib, uh, a US representative, um, a US representative from Michigan wanted to visit her grandmother in 2019, but Israel would not let her uh, if she was still vocal about the occupation. There is um, a battle for who is supposed to be the voice of Jewish people or of, um, of who, what information gets out there. Um, I do not want my voice or my identity to be used for a genocide, uh, and I refuse to be allowed uh, for it to be used in my name. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and thank you for attending today's panel session. Uh, my name is Ritika Singh. I'm a religion and contemporary issues major. Unlike uh, the fellow students here that are from Palestine or are Muslim or Jew, I am neither a Muslim, I am neither a Jew, I am neither Israeli, nor am I a Palestinian. I'm from Asia, actually. I'm from Punjab, India, not the Pakistan side, but the India side. And I'm here to support the Palestinians because this is a humanitarian issue. This is a global issue. Home. Home is a place where one feels comfortable and at ease. A place where one feels secure and safe from the dangers lurking in the outside world. But what happens when those dangers enter the home? loom not outside the door, but within its very walls. Where do you go? How do you bring back that feeling of safety? These are questions the people of Gaza and the West Bank are struggling to find answers to. Answers that in a perfect world, they wouldn't need to find. But sadly, this isn't a perfect world. It's a world that has seen the suffering of many communities in almost similar circumstances at various points in time, justified or ignored by political leaders time and time again. Winston Churchill, a man considered a hero in World War II, once said to the Peel Commission of 1937, I do not agree that the dog in a manger has the final right to the manger even though he may have lain there for a very long time, justifying the looting of land and resources from another people's because a stronger race has come to take their place. Why does the, why does the arrival of a new group of individuals justify injustices and violence towards another? Has humanity truly lost its ability to think critically about these issues? Or is there a bigger power dynamic at play? The suffering of the Palestinians is not an isolated case of oppression. There are several parallels that can be drawn around the world, even today, including the struggle of the Sikhs and the Irish. These groups are connected by a history of colonialism in which the British imperial government partitioned their homelands in favor of majority groups and redlining based on the category of religion, resulting in their groups being split into distinct and faraway lands. Gaza and the West Bank for Palestinians, only a small portion of the Sikh empire for the Sikh and Northern and Southern Ireland for the Irish. The sufferings of these people are a direct result of the partitioning of their land, identity, and sovereignty. 
but does the ability to control the narrative and armed power really let the colonialists slip away from the hands of justice? Yes. The colonialists to this day are not held accountable for their crimes against humanity. They can get away from being involved in these horrifying crimes. These crimes against humanity involve their horrifying mentality towards these groups and many others. The British Empire regarded the people they'd colonized as a means to gain wealth and fulfill their mercenary interests. They never regarded these people as fellow human beings and their hurtful, hurtful ideologies that created an us and an other, defining a majority group as humans and dehumanizing the other to the state of an animal is a policy still in effect today. It has never stopped. Different groups may be using these ideas, but the effects of such a plan are the same. People are dying. Hate crimes are still occurring. No one is truly happy in such a world. I am frustrated that no action and no work is being done to understand this issue at the simplest level, like a human being. Why has the human race lost its empathy? Why don't we see the hurt we bring to this world every single day? This isn't just savagery being committed by one nation. It's savagery being committed by all nations. When one doesn't stand up against injustice, they become equally, if not more, at fault for the results. We need to align ourselves together for the interests of not a nation, but that of humanity. These issues are in the shared ancestry of the human race and must be dealt with in that way. Homes are being invaded and divided, and they have been for centuries. My question to everyone here today and to political leaders and the rest of the world is, when will it end? When will it stop? Thank you. Our next student speaker is Alicia Karacha. Hi, um, I'm Alicia Karacha. Um, I'm a political science major. Uh, sorry, my mic is broken, so I have to use this. Um, so uh, with my identity as a Pakistani American, it comes with a lot of backlash and this notion that I'm a terrorist. This isn't new to me. I've heard this since I was nine years old. I remember sitting in my classroom and we first learned about 9-11. My teacher would bring up the fact that this act was uh, committed by Muslims, but did not actually teach the class um, what Islam actually stands for. And so I was a little nine-year-old girl um, being called a terrorist. And so I thought that I was taught that my identity was something to be ashamed of and something to be concealed. And like Gio, I hid my identity because I was both ashamed and I was afraid. And I think that's the case for a lot of people who are from South Asia and the Middle East or North Africa. The term terrorism is almost a label for us, like it's reserved just for us. You see the disgusting actions that Israel is inflicting on Palestine, but the Israeli government isn't considered a terrorist, but the little kids in Gaza who are being bombed are. I, as a nine-year-old girl, was. It's double standards. This country likes to make it appear that they are welcoming when they're not. And this leads to a lot of discrimination, and we see that with the violence in Palestine. The Palestinians are being brutally killed, yet Palestinians in America are the ones being classified as terrorists or bullies or violent people. Our student voices for Palestine, we created this group so that we could stand up for the people in Palestine who are being bombed and being killed, yet we are considered a hate group. And I think this notion that these people are terrorists is what is, is, what is, what is contributing to so many hate crimes in America towards Palestinians and Muslims, which I'll dive into later. But my parents would tell me stories on the discrimination that they experienced after 9-11 as Pakistanis and Muslims. And I was grateful that I would never have to experience any discrimination like that. But after October 7th, 
vi that the violence that began happening in Palestine, that entire process is being repeated. And I see myself and my friends being attacked for who we are. And it's the same rhetoric that was used after 9-11 to justify that discrimination. And it's not only my identity as a Pakistani Muslim that plays into that, but me living on Long Island and the town I specifically reside in, which is West Hempstead. And if anyone knows about West Hempstead, it is not the most welcoming place. Even before the brutal assault towards Palestine, my mom was harassed at a 9-11 memorial and was almost kicked out because she wore a hijab. After October 7th, my mom was given disgusting stares by the people in our area because of her being Muslim. The other day, we held a vigil here to commemorate the life of Aaron Bushnell and the Palestinians who had lost their lives. And so I walked out of my house wearing a kafia. I was taking my car out of the driveway, and as I drove away from my house, a man stuck his hand out of the car, put up his middle finger, and made a bunch of hand gestures towards me and drove away. And I try to constantly remind myself that those experiences are absolutely nothing compared to what the Palestinians are facing. But it reminds me that whatever is going on in the Middle East or Asia or on the other side of the world will indefinitely affect us here, which is literally the title of the discussion. Um, and I also want to point out that Sorry, this is like bothering me that I see a lot of people shaking their heads and smiling. This is nothing to be smiling about. So, yeah, that's it. And our final panelist, Alma Glavatovic. Hi, my name is Alma Glavatovic, and I'm an Albanian American psychology student here at Hofstra. Um, bringing in my background has a lot to do with why what is happening over there affects me over here. Um, so to give a bit of background on Albania, I'll be quoting from Prime Minister Edi Rama of Albania from his recent joint press availability with Senator Antony J. Blinken of the U.S., and this was uh, last month. So he states, um, speaking of Albania, it was a communist dictatorship, and the dictator was one of the closest friends and allies of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, PLO, and of Yasser Arafat. But this country, on the other hand, is the only country in Europe that had more Jews after the Second World War than before, and it's the only country where Jews didn't fly out but flew in to be protected. And as it is very well shown in Yad Vashem, which is the World Holocaust Remembrance Center, for those who don't know, um, it's a country where the Nazis didn't succeed to get a single Jew. This is the background. Um, so Yad Vashem created an exhibition called Besa, a Code of Honor, discussing the Muslim Albanians who rescued Jews during the Holocaust. And the reason I bring this up is to show an example of how being pro-Palestine does not equate with being anti-Jew, as this is a solid example of a whole country supporting Palestine, but also protecting every single Jew that was fleeing the Nazis, and it is the only country in all of Europe to accomplish that. Um, and then going into my psychology aspect, the psychological effects of all people of Gaza that they're facing, especially children, are extremely alarming. Just a few weeks ago, Doctors Without Borders reported that most children under five say they would rather die than live through what they are living through. I mean, just think of the, the value that holds that a child under five would rather die than live through what they are living through right now. Time Magazine interviewed a clinical psychologist working in the West Bank, Dr. Maram Namer, and she reported that the people are facing PTSD so bad that new symptoms of it are being seen, as well as severe stress and anxiety, and they are living in a constant state of fear. Doctors Without Borders themselves reported, quote, we are trying to survive hunger. Another quote, we don't know if we will survive the next hour. And another quote from another doctor, Dr. Ruba, in which her child said, Mom, can we leave Gaza now? I really just want to live. So this just goes to show not even the doctors there are safe. How can they save other people when they themselves are not safe? It goes to show the circumstances that the people of Gaza and the West Bank are living in. These are just very few examples of the unmatched psychological distress the people of Gaza and the West Bank are experiencing. And as a psychology major, I'm appalled by what I am seeing and hearing. Um, I'll now hand it back to Professor Salim. Thank you.
thank you very much for all of our panelists. I think they've taken us um, quite a bit further along the exploration, um, you know, sharing personal threads, personal experiences, personal analysis of this sort of interconnectedness, uh, historical backgrounds, uh, comparative, you know, political and psychological. I think it's really been some amazing presentations. I'd like to ask them a set of questions before we open up to the audience, uh, perhaps to take things even a bit further. My first few questions focus on the media. What do you think about mainstream media coverage of the ongoing crisis in Palestine and Israel? What media sources did you, do you rely on for information about this situation? Uh, I can take this. Um, Personally, I, I've been very appalled by uh, how media has been describing uh, the words in particular that they describe human lives. Um, during the Flower Massacre, uh, everyone noted how major news outlets would use flippantly um, dismissive um, wording for how to talk about casualties. Um, you could see in how they treat um, Israeli deaths and Palestinian deaths, which are both just as precious. Um, but. Um, the lives, I mean, are ju both just as precious, but how they're talked about in news media. Um, you have full-page paragraphs for uh, individual Israeli soldiers and then barely two words for thousands of children murdered. Um, news outlets that um, have been very good, uh, Amy Goodman of Democracy Now! recently presented, um, and she's been uh, a very good resource on uh, providing um, an accurate um, coverage of the situation in Gaza, in particular to um, Israeli actions, which tend to not go as mentioned in uh, other major sources. Um, but yeah. Yeah, and if I could just add on to that, I think one of the biggest things is the difference between mainstream media and news outlets and Palestinian journalists themselves is the news outlets are telling you what happened, but these journalists are showing you what happened. So there's a difference in the words being told, people being killed, while Palestinians are showing you these people being murdered. They're showing you uh, bodies bombed and the organs on the ground and having to pick them up and rush to the hospital. And you're seeing this from these journalists. And you can't deny that. These are real footage. that, like, This is real footage that you're watching. Um, <clears throat> I also want to add that, um, like the title, whatever happens here affects them there. Um, because whatever the uh, mass media networks in the United States are reporting, people blindly listen to. And obviously the United States, because these mass media networks are residing in the United States, obviously they're going to side with Israel because you know that United States is supporting Israel. And so um, this false narrative that um, a lot of these mass media networks portray about the Palestinians, they affect a lot of people's views because everyone listens to the news, everyone watches the news. Um, and like Zainab said, um, watching what the journalists are showing is so important because I once saw on Instagram that it said that the genocide in Palestine is one of the most well-documented um, catastrophes in history uh, like the Holocaust, yet is, it is one of the most denied. Um, so it's so important to keep on looking at what the journalists are posting because they are literally living it firsthand. Um, just to add to this, <clears throat> there's two types of violence. There's visible violence and then there's invisible violence. Visible violence is instant. It's like bombings, throwing of rocks, gunshots, et cetera, et cetera. And visible violence is very common in the media. You'll see instant reports in mass media, but as well as journalists, explaining uh, that people have been shot, there have been bomb bombings, there's been killings. But mass media coverage forgets the other type of violence, which is invisible violence. It's violence that's long-term, happens over time, so it's more subtle. You can't really see it, but it is still happening. That includes things like T stealing water rights, occupation, stealing of resources, blocking off electricity. These are things we can't see happening, but they still are. They're happening on a slower level, happening in the background. But these are the things that have to be used to explain the visible violence. 
when we talk about Palestinians fighting back, we only talk about them fighting. We don't talk about the back part. We don't talk about what they're suffering that results in them having to fight back. We don't talk about what's going on with the water crisis. We don't talk about them going hungry. These are things that the mass media has to link with the visible violence, because otherwise, then it's a nonsense issue. But it is, it is truly an issue that really needs to be discussed. It's a catastrophe, and the media is making it a catastrophe. Yeah, and I don't want to go again, but I just wanted to say that's super important because of the visible and versus like invisible violence. Like these women in Palestine, we don't see what they go through when they're on their periods. They have to use the tents in Gaza as menstrual products because they don't have any pads. And th there are so many different things that we live life on a daily basis that they have to endure daily, like the starvation, like the food, on top of the bombings that we don't see that the journalists aren't documenting. Thank you very much for that. I think you're absolutely correct. It's very powerful, the kind of images and the messages that the media send. I think, um, you know, sort of building up to the next question, is that we oftentimes see in the media after there's been some massacre, like the flower massacre, uh, the cause of it, the origin is always left vague, right? They're very um, reluctant to say that the Israeli forces were responsible for the massacre. Um, and so I'm wondering, why do you think the dominant media in the US dehumanizes Palestinians and devalues their lives? Well. I can answer this one. Well, we all know that the U.S. and Israel are very formidable allies. They have been allies for decades. Israel heavily is, fund, is heavily funded by the U.S. In, in military aid, giving weapons. They have a mutual exchange of financial benefits, and there's a grander interest for both nations, um, which I believe to be dominance, complete dominance over the Middle East. Um, and you could see this with the rhetoric that's been used that Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East, despite it not being a democracy in practice. Um, and you could see this with Israeli lobbyists and APAC and just how they influence how Palestinians are portrayed in the media. So you could see that with how I think it was the New York Times, how they covered the flower massacre as a chaotic incident when it was hundreds slaughtered just for them trying to get the food that the trucks brought. Um, that was a horrific, horrific massacre. It was a slaughter, and they labeled it as a chaotic incident. And there's, there's a vivid bias right there that needs to be acknowledged. Um, I also think that it's um, what contributes to a lot of the uh, de dehumanization of the Palestinians is Islamophobia. Um, because after 9-11, a lot of people in this country have been Islamophobic. And it goes into like this false um, rhetoric that whatever's happening in the Middle East right now is a war between Jews and Muslims when it's not. Um, you can see in uh, Geo, Geo is a Palestinian Christian. A lot of people don't know that. And because of this false narrative that it's a religious war, so many people are going to obviously be against um, a country that is seemingly Muslim when it's not. Um, also to touch on the notion of it as a religious conflict, we can also, um, the same way that uh, Palestine um, is not representative of Islam in, in any way, uh, Israel is not representative of Judaism. Uh, Israel considers uh, Judaism as um, ethnicity, as other countries do, same way as uh, one would be French or one would be British. Uh, and in that, they divorce Judaism from its religious roots and attempt um, in framing it as a Jews versus Muslim conflict, they don't mean it in a religious conflict when they're talking about it. They mean it in an ethno-supremacist um, conflict where Jews as an ethnic group um, are fighting um, these terrorists. Um, and in that, they divorce kind of the, the, the values of Judaism and they denigrate them too because they evoke um, you know, they evoke the Holocaust in right before they're about to go in. They say never again, and then they go and they kill uh, 40,000 uh, as of right now. Um, yeah. And just to add to that, the reason they dehumanize the Palestinians is because it's easy. I mean, again, with what Alicia said, after 9-11, Islamophobia has increased. So it's just easy. They're Muslims in the Middle East, so 
they obviously equal bad. They're terrorists. It's so easy to name them that. But it also fits the narrative and what, with what Gio said, that it's just the U.S. and Israel have ties, and so the media promoting Israelis and dehumanizing Palestinians just fits that narrative better. It makes it, it justifies why the Biden administration or U.S. foreign policy supports Israel over Palestine. Um, also, I don't mean to go again, but um, it's also this uh, notion of white supremacy because people, especially in the U.S., I'm not sure why, um, believe that little white kids are more important and hold more value than little brown kids. Um, and this goes back, like, not even just the history of the United States, but the history of the world. Little white kids have always, white people in general have always held more value than brown people. And I think that plays a huge role into the violence. Not to speak again also, but that just reminds me that it, again, it, it's because it fits the narrative. It's so easy. Those that write history are always the winners, and the winners are obviously going to put the narrative towards themselves. So this, again, with Churchill's quote, the stronger races. Which one is the strongest race? The white race. Why? Because they're more civilized, they're more secular. Uh, the eastern or the southern um, communities are barbaric, uncivilized, the colored people have no value compared to them because the colored people are living in a different time, a time that is before civilization. Thank you uh, very much for all of those responses. Um, sort of taking it into a slightly different but connected direction, um, I want to note some of the work of uh, scholar Frantz Fanon um, describing the violence of colonialism. The influential scholar Frantz Fanon wrote, their first encounter was marked by violence and their existence together, that is to say the exploitation of the native by the settler was carried out by dint of a great array of bayonets and cannons, end quote. Does this apply to the history and conditions in Palestine and the responses, the anti-colonial responses of resistance of Palestinians? Um, I'll, I can speak for a little bit on this. Um, Zionism, as definition, is a colonial project, as it was initially incepted. Um, Theodore Herzl, the founder of um, what is currently the, the mainstream form of Zionism, uh, was a German Jew um, who wasn't very religious. He was secular. Um, and his ideal vision of the Jewish state was a state that did not speak Hebrew, uh, that would live in uh, Israel, uh, same, they would speak German, they would go to operas, uh, they would uh, you know, be a part of the European community. And you can see this with how Israel engages itself uh, in foreign policy today. Uh, Israel's a part of Eurovision, they're currently com uh, competing with a, a song called October Rain. Um, even though Israel is a country located in the Middle East, um, Israel eight years into its existence, invaded the Suez Canal, invaded Egypt uh, alongside Britain and France in an attempt to uh, protect their colonial possessions and a protect, in an attempt to protect their commerce. Uh, Israel conducts itself the same way that the United States, same way that the European Union conducts itself as a neo-colonial power, uh, which exploits uh, people in the global south and the east uh, as means of um, continuing its own existence. Um, I do want to bring up an important point while we're on this topic. Um, Jews are native to Palestine, the Palestinian Jews, which many people just choose to ignore. So Palestine is not just a single religion, as we've talked about. It's Muslims, Jews, Christians, atheists, whatever. These are our people. This isn't, we're, not, we're not fighting against Muslims. We're fight, they're fighting against Palestinians. And you're also fighting against the Palestinian Jews that are there who have been forced to relocate to what is now Israel. And this just this flies over, it just completely flies over people's heads. Um, just to add to that, um, like you said, that Jews lived there before. Christians also have lived there. 
so that goes into the concept of divide and rule because one, now they're divided by religion, which just doesn't make any sense because they're all branches of the Abrahamic religions. But that's, I guess, what makes it easier. The differences in their religious beliefs, which are quite slight based on how many similarities they have, they, that's the way they were divided. Divide them by religion, rule them by making them fight amongst themselves. This is an unnecessary reason for this war to be occurring because it's everyone's land and it's so easy to share it if we just put these childish almost reasons to fight behind ourselves and actually just learn to see each other as human beings, not as an other, as another religion, as another group of people, as someone that is different from me. Because all of us, at the end of the day, we have hearts, we have feelings, we have emotions, and it just sucks that we continue to hurt them every single day. Um, and also to add on that, I'm not going to answer the question, but I feel like this is important to touch on. If you are against the colonization of the Native Americans all those years ago, if you are against uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, if you're against uh, the imperialism of that the British inflicted on all those countries in Africa, then there is absolutely no reason that you should not be against the occupation of Palestine. And I was going to add, um, going back to the original quote about the violence of colonialism, if we look at the definition of colonialism, um, it is the pursuing and establishment of control of a country, so check, and or exploitation of people and of resources, so another check. Israel controls Palestine's food, their water, their medicine. We have aid trucks in Egypt and Israel on both borders waiting to go in. Israel won't allow them. So when we really look at all these aspects and then think back to colonialism, there really is um, some things we can compare there. Okay, um, perhaps just um, taking a, another sort of look at the, at the politics and bringing it back home. Uh, U.S. politicians in both major political parties are strongly committed to quote unquote unconditional support for Israel. Do you think this policy is correct um, and how do you think it should change and what things can, can we do as a society to, to help to make the change? Um, I can go. So, no, I do not think that this policy is correct. I think the biggest way to change policy is to pressure the policymakers. So we have to keep calling Congress. We have to keep attending protests, putting pressure on our government, because at the end of the day, it's our money funding this genocide. Um, and to uh, hop off of what Zanab said, you can see that it's working. Like, you can see that us pressuring all of our representatives is working. You can see that because um, I know that we're going, this is a further question, but uh, during Biden's State of the Union address, he showed solidarity with the Palestinians. Um, and that's only because he knew that he was losing Muslim voters. He knew that he was losing Arab voters. And it just goes to show that your presence and your pressure, it genuinely does matter. And it's very important. Um, I'd like to just add to that, um, that there are 600,000 uh, Muslim voters in Michigan, um, 600,000 Arab voters, I mean, um, and the state of Michigan was decided in 2020 by 350,000. Uh, Biden has been crashing among people of color uh, since his actions in Gaza, um, and if he loses the election, it will be his fault because of what uh, he has done uh, in the realm of Israel and Palestine. Um, if you're registered a Democrat, uh, I'd like to recommend voting uh, uncommitted, depending on which state, uh, or voting blank as means of you know, telling the government that your vote, uh, your voice actually matters, and you want them to consider your voice, um, which the campaigns in Michigan and in North Carolina have recently uh, encouraged Biden to do, uh, with him uh, very heroically calling Bibi a jackass, uh, which definitely did a lot, um, but yeah. Um, I think unconditional support is just so frustrating because then that points to the fact that <clears throat> nation states can do no wrong. Just because the UN labels you as a st state 
you can just do no wrong. You can't commit genocide against a peoples. You cannot steal other people's resources. It's just not possible. That's why Israel is always supported, is because because they're a nation state. So obviously, they have never done anything wrong. They have never stolen anyone's resources. They are not actively committing a genocide, which is also a reason like foreign policy supports so many other nation states. I mean, India is constantly committing genocide against Muslims and Sikhs. Uh, the current prime minister, sorry to bring up politics, but it's very important. The current prime minister, while he was in his own state, a home state of Gujarat, committed a genocide against Muslims, but then was still put on the BJP ballot and then still is prime minister, but nobody talks about these situations. Nobody talks about it. Everybody turns a blind eye from these things just because they have power. But isn't it the people that give these people power? If the people are suffering, sorry to go for a rant, but this is just so frustrating, because so many people are suffering, but just because these few people are in power, no one has the right to say anything to them. They can just do no wrong. There is no injustice. Is that justice? And also to add on that, um, don't forget what this country was founded on. This country was founded on the ethnic cleansing and genocide of Native Americans. Um, so it doesn't even surprise me that they're going to show unconditional support to Israel. But also, if you think that a group of people should not fight for their rights, I just think it's appalling that America is supporting this because... The Revolutionary War could then be considered a terrorist targeting of the British because how can this group of Americans want representation or want representation in order to be taxed? You should just sit down, be taxed by the British without representation because it's fair, because there is a ruling class that is dictating your every move. It is so fair. It totally makes sense. But clearly, the Founding Fathers did not think this, which is why they then fought against the British. So if America fighting the British for their rights was OK, then why isn't it OK for the Palestinians to fight against the Israelis for their rights? Why isn't it OK for Muslims and Sikhs to fight against the Indian government for their rights? Why is it fair Then when the white people do it, it's OK, but when the colored people stand up, then it's not? What is the response of political leaders to this? Thank you. I think you all have been doing some amazing education. And since we're in uh, an institution of education, I'm wondering about your experience as students at Hofstra. How is the history and politics in Palestine taught in classes? What are your ideas about how instruction about Palestine can be improved at Hofstra? Um, so I guess I'll start off. Um, I had a professor last semester um, who was an undeniably a Zionist. Um, you could just tell. And the problem with that is that in college, I feel like students are the most open-minded that they have ever been. And we look up to our professors to teach us what is right and what is wrong. And so when you have a professor who constantly is repeating um, the violence that Hamas has inflicted on Israel and not mentioning any of the occupation since 1948 before that or any of the violence that Israel inflicted on Palestine before that, then it basically brainwashes their students. And so it is so important that um, I don't want to say that they look on both sides because I don't believe that there's both sides. I think it's only one side but that they also mention the occupation, that they also mention the ethnic cleansing of the Palestinians, that they also mention the pain and the killings and all of the stuff that they, the Palestinians have been going through for 76 years. And I think it's not just professors um, at Hofstra, it's also admin. I mean, just trying to create our club, the amount of push and backlash we had to go through just to be able to get recognized was insane. And the level at which our freedom of speech was suppressed was never before seen. Even when we met with President Poser, she had to apologize to us multiple times because what she did, she knew, was a violation of our freedom of speech. And it's not against her because we're so happy we met with her and talked with her, but it's because of what administration is doing and taught to do to these student groups that support Palestine. We weren't even allowed to you know, go from one end of campus to the other in solidarity together. We weren't allowed to walk as a group. 
And, and, and at that, like, we met with administration, we got permission, we did all the protocols because we're trying to cooperate. But it's when you're trying to cooperate and the other end isn't compromising, then you can't ever meet. And we're students, we're the one paying our tuition money. So we should have a say, shouldn't we? Okay, thank you. Um, sort of building on that, and perhaps other people may want to speak, how do you feel that the equation of anti-Israel criticism equals anti-Semitism has led to the suppression of your voices and civil liberties on or off campus in the general society? Um, I obviously disagree with the notion of uh, being anti-Zionist as uh, anti-Semitic. Um, I don't view um, the idea that Jews can only be safe uh, in a Jewish nation, which is something that Biden said, that if Israel doesn't exist, no Jews would be safe, which I think is something crazy to say in the country with one of the largest Jewish populations on the earth. Um, I fundamentally disagree with the idea of anti-Zionism as anti-Semitism because criticizing Israel, criticizing Israeli soldiers who are committing unquestionably horrific acts is not anti-Semitism. What is anti-Semitism is saying that treating a person, treating a Jew um, as a person, judging their actions morally is anti-Semitic. It is uh, a flagrant you know, denial of everything that represents Judaism. Judaism is built on tikkun olam, which is the idea of building forward, building your community into something better. Um, and we're not even allowed to criticize uh, these people on a religious basis. I find that, you know. All right, so language is the most powerful weapon that they have right now to silence our voices. Um, anti-Semitism is a very real and dangerous issue. Like that is, no one's questioning that. However, crying anti-Semitism every time someone criticizes the state of Israel and their policies, that is demeaning to actual issues of anti-Semitism that are going around. Um, Israel is a colonialist state, and saying that is not anti-Semitic. Theodore Herzl himself called this a colonial, settler colonial project. And, um, and a lot of people, don't know what anti-Semitism is. The word Semite means a person who speaks either Aramaic, Hebrew, or Arabic. Palestinians are Semitic people. Supporting a genocide against the Palestinians is anti-Semitic. And that's, that's just all I have to say. And just to add to that, I, um, I just like to say it's interesting how anti-Israel is considered anti-Semitic, but then no one raises the question of, is anti-Palestine Islamophobic? Is, it's, I, just, I just thought that was, um, I was just curious about that, that that's never talked about. It's, if you're anti-Palestinian, then you're just anti-Hamas. You're not anti-Muslims. You're not anti-Christians that are also living in Palestine. You're not anti-Jews that are living in Palestine. Mm -hmm. And I think because that's so overlooked, then we have such an increase in Islamophobia. I mean, I talked about my experience getting called a terrorist after October 7th, but what about with the, the six-year-old that got stabbed 27 times? Um, because nothing's funny about that. Um, and what about the three, uh, the three students in Vermont who got shot for wearing a keffiyeh? So. Um, and I also want to point out that those are only the cases that we know of. There are cases over here on campus um, where a lot of people have been I'm harassed and spit on and called terrorists, um, it really contributes to this notion of being against Muslims. Okay, some people have touched on this already, um, but perhaps we can elaborate. Um, how will the Biden administration's unwavering support for Israel and complicity in the ongoing genocide influence your vote in the national election this year? I mean, I'm not going to vote for Biden, and I'm not going to vote for Trump. And this is my first election where I'm old enough to actually go and vote. So it's a shame that it's come down to these two people, and neither one is going to get my vote. Um, I'm voting uncommitted um, or for a third party that represents my interests. Um, yeah, to build off on that, yesterday, I think, um, both Biden and Trump were announced to be 
the two presidential candidates, um, which is just sad because we've already been through this. Um, but it's also sad that, like, uh, before I could vote, I this will also be my first um, election where I will be able to vote for president. But before I could vote, bef like during the 2020 election, I was begging everyone in my family to vote for Biden, vote for Biden, um, partially because of Trump's Muslim ban. Um, and s his language towards Muslims and um, people who are brown and people of color. And Biden put on this mask pretending that he was against everything that Trump was saying. And now you see his true colors, and it's just sad. And like Gio, I'm either going to vote third party or uncommitted. And I think that this election is going to be one of the largest um, largest that we're going to see for people voting for third party. Right. Um, just to add to that, I just wanted to bring that up, is we have third parties in our system. I didn't know about third parties. We were never taught that there were third parties when I was in school. So um, this is also my first year being able to vote. So obviously I'm doing more research on who's um, involved in politics. And I found out that there are third parties. So I find it frustrating that they never get a chance to be voted in. They're completely ignored. It's always red versus blue, donkey versus elephant, but there's so many other parties that you can vote for. So I encourage everyone here to not just look at the Republicans and not just look at the Democrats, but also look at the various third parties that are out there, because I think it's time that we give the little guy a chance. Okay, my last question before opening up for, to the floor. Um, if people are looking to get actively involved in supporting Palestine and opposing the ongoing genocide and apartheid, what should they do? I think it's important to read, um, not not watch TikToks, not not read mainstream articles like the New York Times, but read actual books written by Palestinians. You have been dominated with the Israeli thinking and the Israeli perspective your whole lives in the West. So now it's time to read the pal stuff from the Palestinians. Um, if you want to support boycotting, it does it does help. Boycotting Starbucks, boycotting McDonald's, those are two big ones that have you know they've they've already lost billions of dollars. And boycotting works because you know it's the it just it's been known to work. Um, and then just once you get educated, just share it, share it, and just talk to people, um, educate them, um, and then. Amplify Palestinian voices is, is my, what I want to end off on. Make sure they're heard because we're actively being silenced and we've always been silenced. Um, to uh, hop off on that, for Hofstra students, you should join the Student Voices for Palestine. Um, we just got recognized as a group and we would love to see new people there. Um, uh, we're going to plan a bunch of things. We've already done a vigil for Aaron and the Palestinian Lives Lost. We've already done bracelet making. We're hoping to do more informational sessions and educate people. Um, we're hoping to do more fundraisers. So we would love to see you there. And if you guys have any questions, most of us are on the e-board, so you can just come up to us after. And I think another thing is being uh, civically involved um, and staying civically active and engaged. Um, I think people underestimate the power of uh, raising awareness and attending protests. I know Alicia was talking about uh, President Trump's executive order, the Muslim ban. And in 2018, I attended that protest at JFK. And then we voted for Biden. And now I'm attending protests to stop the funding of um, money to Israel. So I think going to those protests and raising awareness and posting on social media and watching these Palestinian journalists are all so important. Um, just to add to that, I think the biggest thing that we need to do is learn to empathize. And uh, one way to do that is, um, so there's a piece called, I think it's called We the Screamers by Arthur Kosler. And at the very end of it, he talks about um, just sitting down and closing your eyes for just two minutes and just thinking about what the people are going through, just visualizing it. Think about how you would feel in that. But I think everybody needs to do that every single day because we, as like a whole community all over the globe, just because we've just lost our ability to empathize with others, 
these phones, these computers, these screens take us so far away from other from human interaction that we're now struggling to empathize. We might sympathize for a little bit, you know, like today we're all sitting here and we feel that this is an issue. But if you only feel it till you get out the door, then that was just sympathy for maybe five, 10 minutes. Empathy is remembering that it's happening all the time, not forgetting it when you're going to binge watch a Netflix series, not forgetting it when you go out to play sports, not forgetting it when you're going out to vote. Remember all the time. Oh, sorry. Um, and to hop off of what Ratika and Gio said, it is so important to listen to Palestinian voices. I know a lot of us are Muslim, and I know that a lot of us are um, Middle Eastern or South Asian, but listening to Palestinian voices is one of the most important things you can do because no one will understand the struggles that they're facing as much as them. Okay, thank you very much. Why don't we open up for questions? We have the uh, use the mic um, in the middle aisle, <coughs> form a line, perhaps. So um, actually, you brought up public safety. At our first meeting, we were harassed by public safety. They kicked us out of the room um, when we had the right to meet. Uh, so we met with the vice president of equity and inclusion, and uh, we reported it as harassment. And I think we've met with pretty much every higher official. Uh, the dean uh, of students, Jamel Christie, President Poser, Vice President Jessica Eads. And of course, we have uh, Lighter, um, our faculty supporting us, which we've met with on several occasions. Uh, we love them. Some of them are here today. But we do have some support. It's just frustrating when all that support is hidden and masked by suppression, but we're slowly, slowly, slowly able to work with them and compromise, and actually the vigil that we held on Monday was sponsored by Hofstra because we met with the dean um, and the head of outreach of the clubs, and they gave us the space. So uh, it's about compromising and working with them. Um, and I also want to, like also mentioned that a lot of people have reported it. A lot of people just don't know how to because I feel like this is something that Hofstra needs to approve on. I talked about it at the DEIC meeting um, that harassment forms are not like not really readily available to a lot of people. Like They don't know where to get it from and so they just ignore it until it happens again and again. And so I think that's just something that Hofstra needs to approve on. And I think also uh, harassment from other students, too, uh, is something that we shouldn't look over reporting. If a student is calling you a terrorist or calling you a token Jew or something, because we've all heard those words, that shouldn't be overlooked as harassment either. We should all definitely, definitely report these things. And the last thing, I wanted to shout out Lincoln, president of SGA, because he's been there for us anytime we faced anything. Um, he's there to help us in any way, so definitely shout out to Lincoln. Hello. Hello, everyone. Um, clearly here, people are getting too emotional, so I'm just going to ask, I'm actually bring it back to what this is about, and it's about the war in Gaza. Um, my question is very simple. Any one of you can answer it. Um, what do you guys feel like needs to happen in order for this war to end? Apologies, this is not a war. This is a genocide. So what do you guys feel like must happen in order for this genocide to end? Um, I think fundamentally, um, fundamentally, the w only way to end this conflict is to recognize people as human. There is blind sides 
um, with everyone. In the West, in Israel, um, people who ignore the conflict, they pick and choose what they want to believe. They pick and choose what they want to see. You need to force yourself to see. You need to force yourself to listen and to empathize. Because without empathy, humanity is lost. And without empathy, we will all, you know, we will all be divided. I don't know if anyone else wants to speak on that, but... I agree. That's all that is required for for this genocide to stop is just for them to stop killing. I mean, that's all there is to it. It's murder. It's continuous mass murder. If the if the murder would just stop, this occupation would just end. If sources resources were given back, if people were allowed to live, not just uh, without weapons, but also with safety, then that's it. Then it, this is done, solved. Thank you, guys. All right, uh, hi, guys. Um, I guess I should just preface this with uh, me saying that I do not support what is uh, happening to the innocent people in Gaza, and that it technically is a genocide. But I would like to bring a point of disagreement here about uh, the religious uh, aspect of this as in what uh, multiple Israeli officials have discussed with uh, using biblical references such as fighting the Amalekites uh, with, uh, in relation to the war. So uh, what, what, what is your thoughts on that? Um, I think the biggest role that, actually, let me try this again. Religion plays a huge role in this uh, genocide, and that is the role of the scapegoat. It is so easy to label genocide as religious differences, and they can always use anything religious to back up murder, but it's never been a religious war. It's never been a religious genocide. And I mean that when I talk about any war in history. If you look at the Crusades, that's not religious war. If you're fighting for land, if you're p fighting to kill people, if you're fighting for resources, for money, then that is just what it is. It is a war about power. If you look at uh, the Indian partition and then what happened afterwards, uh, it currently the government uses the same uh, types of examples that it's a uh, Hindu Sikh Hindu versus Sikh, Hindu versus Muslim fight because the Hindus are being attacked, despite them being 80% of the Indian population, despite there being constant genocide against the Muslims, constant genocide against the Sikh. They're always la labeled as extremists because they're fighting back against oppression. So it's very easy to label it as a religious conflict, but it's very difficult to see it as what it really is, a, pow a power dynamic, uh, a fight for power, a fight for land, a, a fight for resources. Well, yeah, I do, I do agree that it is uh, technically a war for land, but I also do think that there is a uh, religious aspect in this war as well. Uh, thank you. I'm just going to have to respectfully disagree with that. Um, hello, my name is Aiden Smith. I'm a sophomore and an international business major. Um, I'd like to start off by thanking all of you for not only your um, consistency and keeping up with what's going on, despite I know how much it hurts to have to view all of the carnage, the death, the rape, the bombing, the constant sound of the airplanes going over, um, the people who are documenting this, their heads. Um, and I'm just absolutely in awe and inspired by your guys' bravery and your tenacity, your perseverance. So thank you for that. You. Um, of course. Um, what I would like to ask is how can I, as a student, as a black person, as an American, best support you in places like the classroom? Like, for example, or even like spaces like this. Like, for example, I saw someone literally wearing the Israeli flag um, just sitting there and recording y'all the entire time. Um, very cowardly, I might add, not because he was recording, but because it was very obvious that he was trying to make himself smaller because, you know, even though you're wearing the flag, it's very obvious that you have some belief. You're not really willing to stand on it. So, you know, I encourage anyone who is still um, in the support of uh, what Zionists are doing right now, uh, say it with your chest so we can call you out better. Mm -hmm. um, don't be a coward about it. Thank you. 
But what I want to know is that in that situation, what should I do to best support you guys? For like, like for example, during the um, BLM movement, uh, black people were encouraging like white people and um, other people who weren't as easily targeted by the police to be like human shields during the protests or stuff like that, or to not just step out when their grandparents were being racist, but to talk about it with them so the grandparents wouldn't go out and start spreading that racist rhetoric out in public because no one called them out. So what is stuff that's similar to that that I can do for you guys so you guys don't have to continuously be fighting for your lives while trying to get an education? Thank you. I of think course. showing up and showing out, like what you're doing right now is amazing. Asking questions, wanting to engage in dialogue, and spreading awareness, you know, wherever you go, posting on social media, never stop talking about Palestine, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think, for example, what just happened, that is not our goal at all. Honestly, it's okay if people disagree with us, and that's why we talk things out, because we should have civil discourse where we can talk about matters. Mm -hmm. And if you disagree, that's okay. You can sit, you can record us, but we give you an open mic. Talk to us, and we can engage with you instead of asking us if we condemn something and then denying you know, facts that we bring up as well. Does that make sense? Exactly. So we want civil discourse, okay. but civil. Okay. And then um, I think also, um, as we've been mentioning, uh, showing solidarity with Palestinians is what everyone should be focusing on. Um, that involves uh, boycotting companies who are giving their uh, money to um, fund Israel's uh, current efforts. Um, and then on, on a more personal level, um, People that, like, like me, I'm, I'm white. I, I obviously am not the target of racialized violence in this country. Um, so if you are white, if you are um, a person who's uniquely kind of uh, insulated from uh, this conflict, use that insulation as a way to shield others who aren't. Um, we've been talking about, everyone here has talked about hate crimes that has happened to them since October 7th. Um, people constantly stare uh, at uh, Muslim students for wearing hijabs, uh, for just expressing themselves, so showing, being with them, um, and just making sure they're safe, and also just making sure uh, Palestinians are heard, I think are the two primary things. No problem. I think we need to have part two of this panel. What does everyone think? <laughs>